Lord Jesus, tonight you're in your own body, you rose in it, and you can look on the face of your Father, but you're not only in your Father's presence, risen on high, you're also present here with us tonight by your Spirit, because as God, you are anywhere you want to be, and as a man, you are like us, located in a particular place, because you are the great God-man. And it's tonight that we celebrate you. We'll sing your praises and speak about your birth. And we pray, we ask you uh, that you might fill us, that we might be able to do so in such a way that you rejoice. For after all, the joy we experience in life is the joy you give to us. Like you gave to early disciples when you said, my joy and my peace I give to you. So we thank you for that and pray that tonight as we sing your praises, you will be pleased. And we will have a sense of your presence and your pleasure in this place. We ask you this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Advent means coming. And during the season of Advent, we prepare for Christ's arrival. Through the centuries, Christians have observed a time of waiting and expectation before celebrating the birth of Jesus at Christmas. The Advent season proclaims the revelation of God's love as expressed in Christ's birth in a humble stable, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his victorious resurrection. It points to the hope of Christ's coming again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Advent makes innkeepers out of all of us, asking each of us to make room in our lives for the arrival of Christ the King. This evening, our church building will begin to wear its Christmas apparel. As we decorate, we will explain the history and symbolism behind some of our most dearing Christmas uh, decorations. But this service is about more than simply preparing this room for Christmas, we also prepare ourselves in the sanctuary of our own hearts. Please stand and join in singing our first carol, hymn number 118, Of the Father's Love Begotten.
In Isaiah 60, 13, we find these words. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the juniper, the fir, and the cypress together, to adorn my sanctuary, and I will glorify the place for my feet. During long, cold winters, when all the earth is brown, evergreens stand in lowly vigil until the earth is green again. Green represents renewal, new life, freshness, and rebirth. Because the needles of the pine and the fir trees appear not to die each season, the ancients saw them as signs of things that last forever. Isaiah tells us that there will be no end to the reign of the Messiah. Therefore, we hang these grays and greens to signify that the kingdom of God is also without end and is realized in the lives of all of us who believe in Jesus Christ.
most Christmas greenery reflects European traditions. But one colorful plant, which looks like a flaming star, is native to the American continent. The poinsettia, named after Dr. Joel Robert Poinsett, an ambassador to Mexico who first introduced it to the United States in 1828. The people of Mexico and Central America call the brilliant tropical plant Flores de Noche Buena, or Flower of the Holy Night. The poinsettia is a many-pointed star that has become a symbol of the star of Bethlehem. The legend of the poinsettia tells of a girl named Maria and her little brother Pablo. They were very poor, but they always looked forward to the Christmas festival. Every year, a large manger scene was set up in the village church, and the days before Christmas were filled with parades and parties. The two children loved Christmas, but were always saddened because they had no money to buy presents. And they especially wished that they could give something to the church for the baby Jesus. But they had nothing. And one Christmas Eve, Maria and Pablo set out for the church to attend the service, and on their way, they picked some weeds growing along the roadside and decided to take them as their gift to the baby Jesus in the manger scene. Of course, they were teased by the other children when they arrived with this gift, but they said nothing because they knew they had given what they could. Maria and Pablo began placing these green plants around the manger, and miraculously, the top green leaves turned into bright red petals. Soon, the manger was surrounded by beautiful red star-like flowers. The poinsettia has been a Christmas symbol ever since, signifying how Jesus meets the needs of his believers.
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Christmas tree is a reminder of the tree on which Christ was crucified. It serves as a wonderful symbol of our salvation and forgiveness through Jesus. The first mention in history of fir trees used in Christmas celebrations was in 12th century Germany. A fir tree was used in mystery plays as the so-called paradise tree. These dramas were held outside during the Advent and Christmas seasons, and the fir tree symbolized the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. The message of this symbolism was simple. Through Jesus Christ, we too have hope for everlasting life. Indeed, through his sacrifice, Jesus Christ has become our tree of life. As such, the evergreen Christmas tree reminds us that even though our earthly season must come to an end, yet we will live through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The story is told that while walking home one Christmas Eve, Martin Luther was struck with the beauty of the starlight shining through the branches of a small fir tree outside his home. Its brilliance and loveliness led him to reflect on the glory of the first Christmas Eve as seen in Bethlehem's radiant skies. Wishing to share this with his wife and children, he cut from the forest an evergreen, glistening with snow, took it home, and placed upon it candles to represent the glorious heavens he had seen. We see the light, we see the light, the holy light, we see the star, we see the star, the brightest star, we hear the voice. We see the light, we see the star, we hear the voice, we find the way, we hear the angels sing. Alleluia. We see the babe, we see the lamb, we hear the voices singing, Jesus Christ is our King.
As Christians, we use symbols to express visually the basic tenets of our faith. In the Gospel of John, we read the words of Christ himself. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We light one candle on the Advent wreath each week of Advent. The flame represents Christ the light of the world. Traditionally, three of the candles are purple, a sign of repentance and a reminder that Christ came from the royal line of David. The fourth candle is rose or pink and is lit on the third Sunday known as Gaudete Sunday, which in Latin, which is Latin for rejoice. In addition to these four candles, a white candle is placed in the center of the wreath. This candle is called the Christ candle and is lit on Christmas Day to represent the birth of Christ. Finally, the candles are arranged in a circle to remind us of the continuous power of God, which knows neither beginning nor ending.
the most heartwarming expressions of Christmas is the creche, or nativity. St. Francis of Assisi spent his life preaching, caring for the poor and sick, and teaching people to see beauty in all creatures. Though he tried for many years to explain the Christmas story to the people who lived in the countryside, many still found it difficult to understand because they could not read. Finally, in 1223, St. Francis thought of a plan. He sent word to the people of the town of Assisi, come and keep Christmas with me. So on Christmas Eve, he led them to a rocky cave near the town. They carried candles and torches to light the way. When they saw the surprise that was prepared for them, they cried out in wonder. There in the cave was a manger filled with fresh hay. A live ox and donkey stood beside the manger. Real people took the parts of Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and a life-size baby made of wax lay in the manger. St. Francis explained the story as he showed it, how a king born in a stable had brought hope of a better life to everyone. His listeners now began to realize the beauty of the Christmas message. The cave rang with music as he led the worshipers in joyful singing. The next year, these people set up their own manger scenes. The custom quickly spread throughout Italy and then on to other parts of Europe. The nativity speaks of the mystery of God's wisdom, why God chose to send his son into our world as a baby of humble birth, born in common surroundings, we do not know. What we do know is that God reached out to all people, the poor and the wealthy, the simple and the wise, the powerless and the powerful. All who found him knelt in humility before him. Knowing God is possible because he came to us at our level. Whenever we see a nativity, we find ourselves with Mary and Joseph, with the shepherds and with the wise men, bowing before the manger, overwhelmed by God's expression of love in coming to us.
Bells were part of the garb worn by Jewish high priests in the temple. God gave these instructions to Moses in the book of Exodus. The robe of the ephod you shall make entirely of violet material. It shall have an opening for the head in the center. And around this opening there, so, there shall be a selvage woven as the opening of a shirt to keep it from being torn. All around the hem at the bottom you shall make pomegranates woven of violet, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, twined with gold bells between them. First a gold bell, then a pomegranate, and thus alternating around the hem of the robe. Aaron shall wear it when ministering, so that its ringing may be heard as he enters and leaves the Lord's presence in the sanctuary, else he will die. Christmas bells not only symbolize the joy of Christmas, they also remind us that Christ is the high priest. Only he is able to save those who approach God, since he lives forever to make intercession for them. It is fitting that we have such a high priest, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. He has no need, as did the Jewish high priest, to offer sacrifice day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did that once and for all when he offered himself. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the gift of your son, our great high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Would you please stand and sing with us our second congregational carol, hymn number 152, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day.
custom of giving gifts at Christmas comes from the biblical account of the Magi, or wise men, who visited the baby Jesus and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Each of the three gifts represented an aspect of who Jesus is and what his mission was to fulfill. The gift of gold was reserved for royalty. The Magi told King Herod that they had come to see the one born king of the Jews. It is clear that they recognized Jesus as that king. Frankincense was a highly valued commodity and somewhat rare in the ancient world. The Jewish people used frankincense in their worship of God by burning it on the altar. In the temple, the Jews prayed before the altar of incense, which was always kept burning. The smoke rising from the altar represented the prayers of the people rising to God in heaven. The Magi presenting this gift to Jesus showed us that they recognized the fact that he was indeed divine. Myrrh was used for burials. It was placed on the cloths used to wrap bodies to pre help prevent the smell of decay following death. This gift from the Magi conveys the fact that Jesus was born to die. John chapter 3 tells us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The true meaning of Christmas is not the presents we give to one another. It is the gift that God gave to us in his son, Jesus. The book of Romans teaches that God gave us this gift while we were still sinning against him. We did nothing whatsoever to merit or deserve his gift. Despite who we are, God sent his son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is because of God's gift to us that we then give to others. Tonight, the children will bring your gifts to the needy in our community in the form of winter clothing and lay them under the tree. How suddenly a baby cries and all forever change as shepherds leave the angel song to find the holy place where in her young and trembling arms a virgin holds her son and in this child of breath divine, our light has finally come. She ponders how the Magi kneel before and myrrh, Christ's sacrifice they tell. A dream would help them flee a king whose pride would cruelly destroy. As mothers weep, God's mercy meets the
candy maker in Indiana wanted to make a candy that would witness to the birth of Jesus. So he made the Christmas candy cane. He incorporated several symbols into the cane that represented the birth, ministry, and death of Jesus. He began with a stick of pure, white, hard candy. White symbolized the virgin birth and the sinless nature of Jesus. The hardness symbolized the solid rock, the foundation of the church, and the firmness of the promises of God. The candy maker made the candy in the form of a J to represent the precious name of Jesus. It could also represent the staff of the good shepherd with which he reaches down into the ditches of the world to lift out the fallen lambs who, like all sheep, have gone astray. Thinking that the candy was somewhat plain, the candy maker stained it with red stripes. He used three small stripes to show the stripes of the scourging Jesus received by which we are healed. The large red stripe was for the blood shed by Christ on the cross so that we could have the promise of eternal life. Unfortunately, the candy became known as a candy cane, a meaningless decoration seen at Christmas time. But the meaning is still there for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. May the symbol again be used to witness to the wonder of Jesus and the great love that came down at Christmas time.
please bow your heads and pray with me? Our Father, we long for the simple beauty of Christmas, for all the old familiar melodies, words, and symbols that remind us of what great miracle when he who had made all things came one night as a babe to lie in the crook of a woman's arm. Lord, you have caused this world to shine with the illumination of the true light, your only begotten Son. Help us, your people, to reflect that light into every crevice of need around us. We bring you immeasurable gratitude for your love and for all the ways you have heaped blessings upon us this year. And we pray, Lord Jesus, as we begin this four-week journey of expectation and hope, that what we do and say, every tribute of our hearts, will bring honor to your name. May your loving kindness and the true spirit of Christmas not only creep into our hearts and there abide, so that not even the return to earthly cares and responsibilities, nor all the festivities of our own devising, may cause it to ebb away. May the joy and spirit of Christmas remain with us now and forever. In the name of Jesus, who came to save us from ourselves, we pray. Amen. At this time, the choir would like to invite anyone who has ever sung the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah to take a hymnal from the rack in front of you and turn to page 37 and then come join us in the choir loft for our closing song.
please, please remain standing for the benediction. Let's pray. Now may the God who has called us to live in hope and expectation go with you as you journey in faith toward a new future. Created by God's gift of love, by his only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, go in grace and in peace and in him. Amen.